away from the receiver. Testing, 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 testing. The cleaner.
that on the stream, please bear with us for a moment. We'll have this worked out shortly. <laughs> to the Silicon Valley Java Effects user group. Uh, today we've got John doing uh, Java Effects 3D. Some really cool stuff. Probably one of the most interesting sessions we've had in a while. Uh, and before we start, I just got to mention our sponsors. Oracle, of course, provides the venue and the, the food. And a lot of giveaway stuff that we get every week or every month. Uh, Linode, JFrog, JetBrains, we've got an IntelliJ license to give away at the end. For anybody that's interested in that, be sure you stick around. And IntelliJ 12.1 is adding Java text for. Oh, finally. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, yeah, I've been using it a little bit. I mean, it's workable right now, but yeah, even better. And also, APRESS, O'Reilly, and Manning give us books from time to time, and you can get a discount by saying you're a group member from their website. And uh, with that, we'll let John take away. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, let's see. Let me see. Oh, can so, you switch your residency? Sure, yeah, let me do that right now. People on the stream, and it's cutting out right now, uh, occasionally. Let me switch over. Hold on just a second, I think it's, just interrupt this. Screen resolution. Sixteen hundred by nine hundred, is that good, or four by three? I think it wants four by three. Sure. Widescreen thing is Twelve eighty by nine sixty, is that four by three? Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for coming. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. 
Yeah, so my name's John. Uh, I'm part of the JavaFX team. Um, just to give you a little bit about my background, um, I'm hearing an echo. Is that expected? We were, we were testing. Okay, nice. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so to give you a little bit of my background, I studied animation at the UCLA Film School, got my Master of Fine Arts, uh, worked at <coughs> Disney Animation and DreamWorks Animation as a character technical director on Chicken Little, Meet the Robinsons, How to Train Your Dragon, and Shrek Forever After, and a couple of other movies. And then, um, yeah, while I was working at DreamWorks, someone at Sun asked me, hey, how would you like to join this cool 3D animation project that we're doing? And it was kind of like a research project thing, and uh, at first I wasn't really sure, but he sold me on the idea. Uh, it sounded pretty cool, and so I um, joined that project. Uh, and then later uh, transitioned to working on uh, Java FX. And uh, yeah, some of the ideas that we explored there um, uh, transferred over to what we're doing now uh, in Java FX 3D. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, so yeah, let me just go ahead and start. Um, oh yeah, general disclaimer. Uh, yeah, you know, standard verbiage. Okay, so what is JavaFX 3D? I actually asked around, um, you know, the guys who work on this stuff uh, to um, get their opinions. Well, in my in my wording, it's uh, a general purpose 3D graphics library for JavaFX. Uh, Kevin Rushforth says JavaFX adds another dimension to JavaFX, or JavaFX 3D adds another dimension. And uh, Jasper says. Uh, JavaFX 3D gives you the ability to use 3D geometry, cameras, and lights in JavaFX. So those are some pretty good summaries. Um, so what are some use cases? So, you know, visualization, charting in 3D, CAD CAM, medical imaging, marketing, architecture, uh, fancy UIs, um, yeah, training, and even maybe, you know, some uh, very simple games and stuff, perhaps. So you've probably seen this. Actually, this video is in HD. Let's see if it uh, is happy here. Um, let's see. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, my computer is not the fastest computer in the universe. Um, my, uh, it's, um, but it actually serves a really good purpose because it shows you that um, JavaFX 3D can work pretty well on a laptop that's about five years old. So it's kind of intentional uh, in a way. <laughs> uh, but this is what we showed at um, Java 1 in the fall. Uh, it was using a prototype version of JavaFX 3D, and um, it's basically to show how you can use um, JavaFX 3D to visualize uh, shipping inventory, uh, and how that shipping inventory um, moves along, uh, getting picked up by um, different equipment and dropped off onto trucks and stuff like that. And so, yeah, this was in a slightly different API, but it's pretty much the same thing uh, what we're providing now. Um, you know, so movable cameras, meshes, lighting, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, we didn't have time to make the wheels move on this truck, so... <laughs> yeah, I know it was actually a comment on Twitter, hey, the wheels on the truck aren't moving. But we're working on that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, um, this uh, application was actually written by Navis, well, the 2D part, the ex minus the 3D was written by Navis and Canoe, and then, um, yeah, three of us uh, on JavaFX added the 3D 
um, as a proof of concept uh, and to kind of test out a 3D prototype at the time. Um, yeah, so what you see here, it, uh, it's basically the same kind of functionality that exists in JavaFX 3D today. Okay. So, yeah, what are some of the features of JavaFX 3D? There's, uh, of course, meshes, uh, cameras. Cameras are now a node. Before, they weren't a node uh, because um, for the type of 2D work that we were doing previously, it didn't need to be a node, but now it is a node. Uh, we also have a sub-scene, which I'll describe. Um, lights, um, materials, 3D picking, and you know helpers for controlling the level of detail. So before we dive into the new features, let's talk about what was already possible in JavaFX 2. So basically, the only 3D thing in JavaFX 2 uh, was transforms. And, uh, but they were actually quite powerful. Um, and so you actually could transform 2D primitives in 3D uh, to, get, to move them around in 3D space. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we do with transforms. I don't know if, is that easy to see up there? Um, basically, uh, the transforms in JFX are, are very uh, flexible. So down here you see, let me try to highlight this. Yeah, okay, well anyways, let's get transforms at all. So you can customize uh, your transforms with um, any number of what I call sub-matrices. Uh, and it's, the behavior is actually very, very flexible. So like, for example, I, I use Maya a lot. You can basically mimic, mimic the behavior of Maya transforms, uh, transform groups and joints uh, pretty much exactly. And I would imagine that you could probably do that with any other uh, 3D package out there. So there's a certain matrix structure to a transformer joint in Maya, and you can get the exact same behavior in JavaFX. This is a simplified uh, transform structure. It basically has um, translations and then um, three order angle rotations and, and the scale. Uh, this one, I just added a pivot. So, you know, you're doing a translation, you're pivoting uh, so that the rotations and scales will uh, happen about the pivot and then undo the pivot, uh, which is the inverse pivot at the end. And so, why, do, why even do this? Why not just use groups, right? Well, you can, uh, but if you just use the default functionality that groups provide, um, it's great for 2D, right? Uh, however, uh, you'll want to do something like this for 3D, and the reason is because uh, when groups were designed for 2D, they have this behavior that the default, especially the rotation and the scale, uh, it's designed so that the pivot automatically recalculates so that it's at the center of the node's layout bounds, which is what you want for 2D, but it's not what you want for 3D. And so you actually want to customize your own uh, transforms uh, like this or like this um, so that your pivot doesn't automatically be calculated. If you add your own uh, rotations and scales, which you'll want anyways because uh, the default is only one rotation about one axis and you'll probably want it to be something as flexible as this or even more flexible than this. Um, yeah, but if you use the default rotation and the default scale, inside of a group node, then as that stuff moves around, the pivot will recalculate, which will mean that stuff will move around magically for you, which is perfect for 2D UI, but it's not what you want for 3D. So please uh, keep this in mind. If you want to learn more about it, there's actually a Jira file. It's Jira 12849. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, basically let me read a bit here. Uh, for a group node, any change to any of its children, including position, orientation, and scale, will cause the layout group balance to change, which will move the object. So you don't want to rely on the 2D um, rotation and scale that's built into a group. You want to customize it so you have full control over it and it doesn't 
do this 2D low layer bound uh, centering recomputation thing. Okay, so there are a whole bunch of useful methods on low that you'll really want to get to know for 3D. Um, these are some of them. My favorites are get local to scene transform and get local to parent transform, um, which, you know, get local to scene transform basically uh, will give you uh, the transform from the root all the way down to uh, the node that you're interested in. Very, very powerful stuff. Okay, so mesh geometry. We have um, user-defined shapes, uh, you know, meshes, and we have predefined shapes to make it easy for you to just put something out there, boxes, cylinders, and spheres. Um, and for meshes, uh, currently we just have a triangle mesh, uh, which is, you know, uh, pretty good. Um, and uh, so you create uh, a triangle mesh, you set the points, texture coordinates, uh, the faces, and then smoothie groups. So what smoothie groups do is it uh, basically tells which faces you want to uh, look like they're part of the same, um, basically they share the normals so they look smooth. Um, so like in theory if you had a different smoothing group for each face it would look very faceted, but if every face were in the same smoothing group it would look smooth. Okay, and uh, the, let's see, so yeah, basically it's pretty simple for boxes, you just specify the three dimensions. For cylinders, you specify the radius and height. And for spheres, you specify the, um, the radius. So let's take a look here. Okay, let me bring this up. Let me hide that over there. Ah, let me restart this. So uh, I'll tell it to you like it is. There are a few bugs still. And uh, if you bring up a 2D UI um, and um, you have 3D geometry, it will mess up the depth buffer. So there is a, uh, I'll talk about workarounds and stuff like that as we go along. But yeah, this stuff is still definitely in progress. Bring this up over here. Oh, here, I'll show you that later. <laughs> Okay. So uh, these are the uh, primitives that are super easy to create in Java FX. Um, yeah, pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, so I'll keep on going through. Actually, let me show you the deep now. So we also support 3D meshes. So let me load up. Um, Let's see, which one should I bring up here? Duke Marble. So this is Duke with like a marble style texture. Let me hide the primitives. There we go. Yeah, so this is, um, this is a, a custom mesh. Okay. Let's keep on going. Oops, let me close this one, bring up this one. Okay, 3D primitives, Duke demo. Okay, so cameras. So JavaFX provides a perspective camera. Um, and uh, the important thing to note is that because JavaFX was initially um, 2D, the y-axis is pointing down. Now, if you're used to 3D, you're probably used to, well, I'll talk about it actually in a second, but basically uh, there are two constructors for creating a perspective camera. One of them is more useful for 2D UIs, and one of them is for 3D. So what you want to do is you want to use a second one. Um, and uh, yeah, the argument is a little bit confusing, so I'll explain it. Um, it, fixed eye position true is basically what you want for 3D. Um, it's, if you've done 3D before, this is the kind of behavior that you're used to. If fixed eye position is false, uh, basically it'll make it so that the camera has its origin in the upper left corner of the panel, and um, as your window size changes, it'll 
automatically move your camera for you so that the origin is in the upper left hand corner. So um, you may ask, why would you want a perspective camera for 2D UI anyways? Well, even though JavaFX 2 and whatever, 2.1, 2.2, uh, was primarily 2D, it let you look at the 2D UI with a perspective camera so you could, you know, transform planes and stuff um, in 3D uh, coordinate space. Uh, but it still was this, uh, if it's false, which is the default, um, that's meant for a 2D UI. Okay, so please set it to true if you are interested in getting a true 3D camera behavior. And the camera is now a node in the scene graph. Before it wasn't a node, so you couldn't put it under group nodes and transform it in space, but now you can. And um, yeah, uh, you can set the field of view. Uh, if you've done photography, you're very familiar with this, but um, you know, if you uh, have a fisheye lens and you want to like see everything and it's going to be, you know, visually pretty distorted, then you set it up to 180 degrees or even more. Uh, normal lenses, probably around 40 to 62 degrees. And telephoto zoom lenses are like, you know, 1 degrees to 30 degrees-ish. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if it's a telephoto lens, like objects in the, um, in the distance and objects in the foreground, they'll appear more similar in size. Uh, just, you know, if you've done photography, it's the same deal. Uh, if you have like a fisheye lens, the difference in size becomes much greater. If an object's really near, it'll be super huge. And if an object's far, it'll be like super small. And um, yeah, we can set the near and far clipping planes. I'll demonstrate this in a bit. Um, and uh, here's a tip. Um, don't set your near clipping plane to be a value smaller than your need and your far clipping plane to be a value larger than your need because it does weird things to the math. It's not just JavaFX, it's CG, computer graphics, 3D in general. Um, if you're like, near clipping plane is like 0 .00001, uh, it does bad things to the math and it does bad things to the visuals. So uh, let me <coughs> show you that. Uh, let's see here, okay. So remember what I said before about if you bring up a 2D UI, it's going to mess up, mess up your um, uh, depth buffer? Well, the workaround is to put a texture on your, uh, on your, it could be just a very simple texture, like just a white texture or something. But uh, that will um, uh, work around that issue for now until it is uh, fixed and checked into the main line. Um, but uh, yeah, if it didn't have a texture, if it looked like that, then yeah, the depth buffering does become messed up. So that is a known issue. And um, actually, there is a fix for it uh, in the sandbox, but it hasn't been checked into the main line yet. Um, OK, so let me turn that off. Let me show you guys some of this stuff. Oh, this is kind of like my cheat sheet. It's not meant for public consumption, but uh, this is how I'm going to control some of this stuff tonight. So for field of view, like let's say I'm making my field of view. You know, let me load up. Uh, you know, I don't want to spoil some of the other stuff I've done. Uh, which, let me see if I have some a file that's good to. Um, Oops, I'm kind of, mm, let's see. Oh, I know, I know. I'll go ahead and show um, uh, primitives, scenes, platonic. OK, yeah, this is a good one to show. OK, so if my field of view is like really, really small, then objects in the distance and objects in the foreground, they're about the same size. I mean, they're about the same size in real life, but, or <laughs> real life in the 3D world, uh, they appear like the same size, basically. So you see the, as I, you know, move this 
around. They look like they're about the same size because my field of view is really, really small. And if I set my field of view to be really, really huge, and of course I have to adjust my camera position. Okay. Whoa, pretty cool, huh? That's like a fisheye lens right there. You know, that's what you get with a, a pretty crazy fisheye lens, you know? Okay, let me reset it, because that's kind of hard to look at, right? <laughs> it's kind of fun. Okay, let me reset the field of view. Move my camera back. Oh, boy, I've created more than one of these. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so let me uh, talk about clipping planes a bit. Here, let me close the ones I don't need. So it doesn't get too confusing. There we go. Okay, so if I move my near clipping plane too close to the geometry, then you can see it starts clipping it. So you may say, okay, I'm going to move it as far back as I possibly can. But the problem is, if you move your far clipping plane too far back also, and actually I set limits on it so it doesn't, um, <laughs> so it doesn't set it too far, but if you set it, if you set your near clipping plane way too close, and your far clipping plane way far back, then the geometry starts rendering kind of weirdly. Um, and I've, uh, you know what, let me go ahead and make it so I can do that just to show you what it looks like. So this is more of a cautionary thing because, um, uh, true story, so when I was working at, oh, <laughs> it keeps on loading up with that file, huh? Okay, yes, it's my uh, primitive scenes, platonic simulation. Do -do -do, turn that off, okay, bring up the UI. So this is a true story. When I was at Disney, I was, uh, someone called me over and said, hey, what's going on here? And they had their near clipping plane to be like um, something, yeah. So this, my near clipping plane is like super small and there's basically some crazy number of craziness happening. Uh, it's basically dividing certain numbers by a very, very small number and the computer's getting confused. So if you see stuff like this, it's because your near clipping plane is like super, super small, or your far clipping plane is like super, super far away, and the computer's just getting confused. It's um, uh, numerical, gets into numerical error, if you know what I mean. So I just wanted to show you this because um, it's, it's happened to people. Like, you know, they might not be aware of uh, the fact that it's bad to have a clipping plane that's super small. Um, but yeah, you'll see stuff like this. And it's not just in JavaFX, it's in, it's in the multi $10,000 packages too. So, <laughs> uh, I just thought you should be aware. Okay. Okay, let's keep on going. Yeah. Okay, oh, this is a fun one. It's, it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Y down versus Y up. So, Ever since the dawn of computer graphics, you know, people have said, what's up? And of course, 2D packages like, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, and all those other packages, Y increases as you go down, right? Which makes sense for 2D, because, you know, you think of a, when you start writing on a piece of paper, you start on the upper left-hand side, usually, uh, if you're um, in the Western world, I guess. Um, and it does make sense for 2D, but a lot of 3D coordinate systems have Y increasing as you go up, uh, which makes sense because usually you think of X going this way and then Y going this way and Z coming out. And some packages have Z going up, you know. But um, 
what's the right answer? And the right answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they're both right, right? I mean, they're both right, everyone's right, it's all good. Uh, so, you know, JavaFX by default, uh, Y is down, X is to the right, and Z points into the screen. Um, and, uh, but what if you want your 3D scene to be Y up? And I'll give you at least three ways to do that tonight. Uh, so one is pretty simple. You just stick everything that's 3D into a root node, and then you just flip the root node in X by 180 degrees, and Y is up for everything in uh, that um, in that root 3D node. Or this is actually what I did: um, is you could take your uh, camera, stick it inside an X form, and note that I used X form which you've seen earlier. Uh, X forms a subclass of group. It has my own set of transforms, so it's not going to encounter that auto-pivoting that was designed for 2D UI, which you don't want. You don't want the auto-pivoting that's designed for 2D UI happening in your 3D scene because then things will automatically move around for you, which you don't want, right? <coughs> so I took my X form, I added, um, I basically parented my X camera X form under the, my root and then parented my camera to the camera X form. And then instead of flipping the uh, geometry 180 degrees, I actually turned my camera upside down. Right? I know, it, it, starts, it gets confusing until you think about it for a while. It, it does work. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually looking Y up in, my, um, in that stuff that you saw. So Y is actually up. Uh, but you can get a little bit, you know, as I thought about it, you know, you could get a little bit more clever. You could actually um, do something very similar, but actually add an RZ rotation by 180 degrees to your camera and then turn that upside down and then put that under your camera X form so your camera X form starts out with clean values. Otherwise, your camera X form does have one. Um, RZ in, in 180. So this is a little bit cleaner. It keeps your camera X form in a more pristine state so you can move that one around. Okay. So, but what if you want Y up and Y down at the same time? Is that possible? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. It's not checked into the, uh, it's not publicly available yet, but it's being worked on right now. Subscene. This is what subscene is for. You can have Y up and Y down at the same time. How is that? Basically, you can have more than one camera per scene. Uh, so subscene is a special mode that separates your scene. You can render part of the scene with one camera, part of the scene with another camera. You can use this for overlaying UI controls, a heads up display, and you can use it to have Y up for your 3D elements and Y down for your 2D elements, two cameras, one scene, or more than two cameras if you want. But this is one way you can do it. So the age old question, Y up or Y down, the answer is yes. OK, so lights. I, I like lights a lot. So lights, you know, they interact with the geometry and, uh, you know, and the material. It gives you a visual result. And uh, right now, there's just two types of light sources, ambient and point light. But of course, uh, we are definitely open to adding more in the future. OK. So yeah, that's the class hierarchy. That's what the code looks like. You create a light. You set its color. Uh, you can parent that directly to the world, or you can put it under a group uh, and move the light or the group around. So let me show you. Actually, let me talk about this and then show you both together. So materials. Materials, uh, you can set a bunch of stuff. Uh, right now, you know, in 8.0 we'll have Fong, uh, which will let you set the ambient, diffuse, specular, color, and map. Um, actually, I should have put normal map. It's technically normal map. Self-illumination. And you can share uh, materials between uh, different uh, shape nodes. So that's the class hierarchy. That's the code. Uh, you basically create a fog material. You can um, uh, use an image, set the 
diffuse map, the normal map, and the specular color, and then take your geometry and set its material to that material. Okay, so let me show you some <coughs> lights and stuff because it's always fun to see this stuff. And now I can play this animation. I was kind of holding it back for a while. So uh, I'm going to put the animation in there so you can see how the light reacts to the material. And if you look very carefully, um, you know, let's take a look at this guy over here. It looks as if uh, there are grooves in this geometry. And uh, it looks even more so like that if you um, take your light and start moving it around. Because, you know, like this indentation over here, it looks like it's, it's really there. But it's actually not in the geometry. That's what the normal map does. It um, basically uh, gives you the appearance of having um, more surface detail than is actually in the mesh geometry itself, which is kind of nice. Here, let me change the color of the light so it's a little bit uh, easier to see, perhaps. Let me uh, slow it down. Yeah, so it, it, as you move the light across the surface, it really feels like the surface has that extra detail, and that's what the normal map gives you. Uh, and each of these surfaces are textured and norm have a different normal map uh, to kind of show you what the visual effect is like. So here, uh, let me use this out first, bring it this way. You know, it appears as if the surface has those bumps in it, but those, uh, those bumps aren't actually um, uh, in the mesh. Uh, it's not modeled into mesh. It's what the normal map gives you to give you the appearance. And you can tell, you can break the illusion if you look at it from the side. See, because if you look at it from the side, it's like, aha, it's all a trick. That, that bumping isn't really there. You know, it doesn't actually displace the geometry. That would be a displacement map, which, uh, uh, yeah, is something else. But, um, yeah, this is what the normal map gives you. And, uh, yeah, you know, you can create different effects with that. Like, for example, this one's kind of like a frosted glass kind of look. Let me zero this up, bring it over here. Let me bring it more forward. That's a little bit too bright. So it kind of gives you a frosted um, appearance. Move it this way. And this one is, you know, yet another different kind of appearance that you could create with your um, diffuse and normal maps together. These are this out. Yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah. Oh, if you're curious, this animation uh, <coughs> is actually pre-simulated in Maya. I did quite a bit. Uh, we have at various points hooked up different physics solvers to um, to uh, JavaFX. Um, and in fact, Jasper just hooked up a physics solver yesterday. But uh, I didn't have it at the time when I was making this, so it's pre-simulated in Maya. Um, yeah, which is fun because you can actually make time go backwards. Yeah, And if you wanted to place a bet, you know where it's going to land. <laughs> so you can make a lot of money that way, potentially. Well, I'm just kidding. But, uh... Is this all being done the CPU or being done by GPU? Oh, yeah. The CPU versus GPU question. Um, since it's pre-simulated, at this point, it's just, you know, basically cached out and the uh, CPU is playing it back. So there's no... But the GPU is doing the rendering, of course. The GPU is rendering all the, uh, all the 3D elements. The GPU is doing all the 3D visuals. But there's no job effects access to the GPU. 
If you mean like that, uh, Joe, do you know the answer to that? Uh, there's no direct access. Okay, there's no direct access. Yep. Cool. Okay. So um, let's see over here. Okay. Let me see what else I can show at this point since I've already um, gone over these two things. Yeah. So um, don't blog about this because we're going to show it at Java 1. Uh, don't worry. Nobody else will see it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you're watching it, don't, don't blog about it. But um, so um, yeah, Jasper said, hey, you know what? We like Duke and uh, what if we had a Duke chess set? And so I uh, thought, okay, yeah, I'll model a Duke chess set. So this is just for you guys, you know, to look at. We're going to show this at Java 1. But so we created a Duke themed chess set in Marble. Yeah. And. Uh, yeah, who knows? We may even make it move around by the time Java 1 comes around. Well, I'm not making any promises there, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't be too surprised if something like that happens. So let me just show you this with different lights. Uh, let me bring the light forward. Oh, that's a little bit bright. Let me turn it down a bit. Yeah, there we go. So, you know, like with these lights, one thing you can do is use one light as your key light, use another light as your fill light. It's, you know, pretty similar to what you do in photography. You know, it's a little bit too you know, obvious. Let me just turn it down a bit. And then you can use one light as your um, rim light, you know? Like, uh, let me make it yellow and put it in the back a bit. You know, kind of give it... Yeah, put it up here. Uh, let me turn it down a bit. Why am I not seeing that? Uh oh, is it trying to? I once had this hooked up to two monitors, and uh, I really hope it's not trying to show it on the other monitor that doesn't exist. Which, yeesh. It's <laughs> brought up my color editor on my second monitor because that's where it was before. Ah, oh, man. That is inconvenient. Okay. That happens sometimes. Okay. Let me just close this up and start it up again. Do -do 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 This happens with more expensive packages, too. <laughs> okay. So, just as a reminder, I'm, I'm running this on a, uh, a five-year-old laptop. And, uh, oh, this, this guy keeps on coming up. <laughs> it's, uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Let me, let me bring up something else right now. Let's see what we have here. So, uh, you know, it's the year of the snake. I was thinking of modeling a snake, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. But I took some, um, I took some uh, pyramids, no, uh, cones. Cones are pyramids, basically one of the two. And I, uh, oh, here we go. Yeah. Let me change the background color. Let me get rid of this axis. Let me uh, make this a little black. Let me just make it all the way black. <laughs> yeah, so this is animated in Maya. And, um, you know, you can turn the scene as they spin around and stuff like that. Um, uh, but this is using, um, remember I talked about this X forms in the beginning? Uh, these are basically using the equivalent, it's created an X form equivalent to a Maya joint. So basically I've animated this in Maya with Maya's joints, and now I'm um, uh, brought into 
into JavaFX, and it's basically doing the exact same thing in JavaFX because we mimic that same joint structure in JavaFX and um, uh, the animation as well. So therefore, we get this kind of stuff happening. And you know, it, if you look closely at the surface, it has has that uh, normal map to create. Um, the illusion of having more surface detail. So if I take my uh, lights and I, you know, move my lights around the surface, you know, it does have the illusion of having, um, you know, those uh, snake scales or whatever, you know, on the um, on the surface. So move it back a bit. I just thought that might be a little bit fun to look at. Okay, let's see. Let's see what else we have here. Okay, so let's say you're uh, interested in something a little bit more serious. So, um, let's see. That's my... Uh, oh, you know what? Let me take a step back. Um, let me talk about... Um, so like this is, for example, what a cube would look like with just a diffuse map. You've already seen what a cube looks like without a texture map, but this is just with a diffuse map. You know, and um, this is what it looks like with a diffuse and a normal map. So it definitely en enhances the visual appearance. So it feels like it has those white things sticking out of it, you know? Stucco or whatever it is. Let's say it's stucco. Well, you know, uh, like if you had a sphere, this is a sphere uh, with just a diffuse map. You know, well, it, it, it does look nice, right? I mean, a fake planet, imaginary planet. But, you know, you bring up you add that normal map, you know, and it adds an extra level of uh, detail to it. Let me turn on the light. The light's a little bit too glowing. Uh, turn this down a little bit as well. And then let me move it around across the surface. So it, it really feels like it has uh, those continents sticking up out of the uh, geometry, when in fact, you know, the geometry is actually very, very simple. It's just a sphere. It doesn't have that, um, the continents sticking up out of it. Uh, the geometry is just what you saw before. It's just this. With, you know, or to be more specific, it's just this. Yeah. So, you know, using those extra features, it does enhance the visual quality of um, what you're doing. Uh, let me see, what else do we have here? Space shuttle, okay. So, um, this, uh, it needs a little bit of uh, 10 to 11 care. It doesn't have a texture map, it's very faceted. And it also uh, doesn't have texture, so it's showing that um, because I already brought my UI up, you can see through the object, but um, you know, it actually can look a little bit um, interesting. <laughs> I mean, we can use the visual artifacts to our advantage to kind of give it a certain look. But you know, this is just an example of bringing real-world uh, data into JavaFX, uh, and with a little bit more love and care, we could uh, make it look a lot more realistic. Okay, let's see what we have. Well, let's see what else we have here. Um, let's see. Swish oh, by the way, if you if you were at the Java one two years ago, you saw Duke doing some animation, jumping around, cartwheels, and stuff like that. Well, that requires something called skidding, which we had in our prototype. Um, it was very fast because actually that the skidding algorithm ran with the GPU. Uh, someone asked a question about the GPU earlier. Um, but it only worked for a certain number of vertices in our prototype and a certain number of joints influencing each vertex. So it was very hard-coded toward a, uh, a very specific case. 
uh, which is great for demos, but um, not good for a general purpose API. So we don't have hardware skinning at this time, running on the GPU. Uh, but who knows? You know, maybe we'll make some, uh, you know, do some software skinning by the time the next Java one comes around uh, to bring Duke back to life. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see what we've got here. Mm, let's see, I'm showing the Duke model physics rings. Okay, rings. Okay, this is what you saw before. So, uh, to give you an example of my workflow, um, you probably saw me playing around this before. This is uh, a package called Maya. Uh, Maya, 3D Studio Max, Blender, uh, you know, Lightway, those are all 3D content creation packages. You know, you can kind of think of them as. Um, the 3D authoring tool equivalent of what Photoshop and Illustrator are in 2D. It basically lets you create uh, content in 3D. So um, here I have uh, you know, created some rings in Maya. And um, yeah, let's load that into JavaFX. So <laughs> it keeps on, I keep on creating these little windows over here. So uh, yeah, let's go ahead and bring that in. So it's pre- well, the lighting is kind of fun. <laughs> so as you can see, you know, I pre-simulated it in Maya because I don't have a Phoenix engine hooked up uh, in um, uh, JavaFX right now. I mean, Jasper just hooked it up yesterday, but I don't have his code with me. Um, but it is doing the uh, 3D um, uh, rendering in, in JavaFX, so you can see it's, you know, I can move my camera around it as it's running. And my lights are a little bit funky because I was trying to make the spatial look all fancy, so let me just kind of set that back to its default-ish colors. So you can see the texture a little bit more. And I've created a, a texture with more than that to give it kind of like a grungy kind of uh, uh, dilapidated chain kind of look, you know? So, uh, yeah. And this is all running on a five-year-old laptop, you know? Um, so this is the kind of stuff that you could do in JavaFX, and in fact, you can hook up, you know, if you so desire, you can hook up physics um, directly to JavaFX as well. You know, and of course, I already showed you before, you can move around your lights. Do, 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 which is always fun. Yeah, let me show my axes. Let's see. Let's see here. Let me You know, I'll, you know, I'll set my key light to be something a little bit more yellowish. Bring it a little bit more forward. A little bit more of it to the left. Uh, my fill light, why not? Let's make it, oh, uh, what color should I make it? Any color preference? I don't know. Blue. Oh no, that's kind of boring. Uh oh, oh no, please. Oh, okay, let me run away. <laughs> uh, let's see, maybe green. Oh, interesting how that, oh, I didn't really choose green, did I? Oh, that looks too scary. How about something a little bit more? Well, that kind of looks, hmm. Yeah, maybe something like that. And then my rim light, I'll make it uh, kind of uh, purplish. And I'll stick that in the back. Yeah. It's kind of um, showing up over there. So yeah, this is JavaFX 3D. Um, and uh, oh, let me show you some more stuff. So um, yeah, let's see what we have here. Um, picking, that was the next item on my slides, wasn't it? Yeah, picking. So I'm a picking demo. Uh, I haven't played around the code yet myself, um, but it's pretty neat stuff. 
Let me go back to here. Pip test 3D. So uh, this was written by Pavel, um, another member of the JavaFX team. And he's done some really fun stuff with it. So like, you can pick stuff in 3D and move it around. It's almost like what we call a manipulator in 3D. You know? So you can, here, why don't I just make it full screen? Oh, I don't think it resizes this one. But you know, you can drag individual elements, spin them around. So this is the kind of stuff that you can do with picking in 3D. So you can kind of imagine the kinds of UIs you can create with this. It could be pretty fun. And uh, let's see, let me show you another demo. Yeah, question, how does the map, the mouse get mapped in the 3D space? Yeah. yeah. The overlay in front of the I haven't played around with this yet, <laughs> so I don't have a good answer. There's some touch uh, things that are different from the mouse as well. Uh-huh. That I saw some references to where you'd use a, a touch that can be built into JavaFX. And it's different than the mouse. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to the details, I just wanted to get into detail on how touch would be. I don't know anything about touch. Joe, do you know anything about touch? Or? It's a feature that we've been working on. I don't know if it's in mainline. Uh-huh. I know. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it is there. Around, yeah. 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 It's been there since. Obviously, for the touchscreen type devices, uh, but I haven't used it myself, so I don't have uh, right. an informed answer so to give you. Probably with touch or your mouse, um, you're getting picking events, and those and, and effects are, are standard. Um, and so uh, each one of those 3D shapes there is, is a node that can be clicked. And basically, when you click on the screen, it's taking that 2D coordinate and mapping it into the scene. And with uh, the transform effect on the screen. It actually uses some of the similar uh, bounds to scene to local and stuff like that to transform transform that 2D point um, and figure out if it hits the node mm -hmm. or is in the node's bound. Um, so that's how there you click there, that's what's going on. And that's whether you click with the mouse or touch with your finger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then some old some stuff on the older job effects is whenever I touch something you it to jump there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, maybe the older, uh, so before we had multi-touch as a feature, um, in order to uh, in, interact with your hand, it would just count that as the mouth. Yeah. Um, just because we didn't have support at the time. That's going to be a separate binary, so if I want to do a mouse or a touch. Well, I think, I think it's, it's the same library, it's just separate events. So we actually, I think we have actual touch events now as opposed to before okay. um, touching with your hand just prior to mouse events. Or yeah, that's what it was. Use mouse events that it's worked on a touch screen. Yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Back to this question. So the Z, the index for when you actually do a picking event, the mouse is always in front. Yeah. That's how they handle it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, and uh, there is a little bit of uh, uh, this is a little bit kind of an interesting problem because uh, if you have two things that you can pick in 3D and one is in front of another, you have to determine. You have to you know know that the person's clicking on the one in front. Um, and I think you can also set nodes to be skipped in picking. So if you want, you can have your node uh, be uh, ignore picking, so that if mm. it's clicked on, then and there's something behind it that can be picked, you can pick the one behind it. 
Um, it's pretty it's pretty powerful actually, obviously, <laughs> with this with this demo. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty much. Yeah, so I can't wait to see what you guys do with uh, 3D picking. Okay, so this last demo um, was written by Ole Mazarov. And he was inspired by something that he saw somewhere else. And uh, basically it's raindrops falling on a surface and deforming the surface. You know, so it just shows that you can do surface deformations, you know, for various purposes. Like, for example, skinning uh, is one type of surface deformation where you take the geometry and you skin it to joints so it reacts to those, to that joint animation. Oh, by the way, when I say skinning, I don't mean 2D UI skinning, I mean like 3D mesh skinning, which is different. Um, but, uh, yeah. So... Yeah. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, uh, feel free. Yeah, go ahead. You can talk to about that you pre-animate in life. Uh-huh. Does that mean that Java FX 3D API, as it's written, allows you to just, you know, load in and use uh -huh. some kind of animation script that Maya or some other 3D package generate? Excellent question. Excellent. That's a very excellent question. Thank you very much for asking that. Well, okay. So there's what we have internally for testing purposes and stuff. I mean, we do have uh, a very good importer internally for testing. Um, we plan to release an importer for at least one 3D file format. Uh, and someone else just this week, apparently, has created an importer for four file formats, right? I believe it's um, OBJ, Colada, STL, and 3DS. And you can download it from FX. There's a link to it yeah. from fxexperience.com. Uh -huh. Yeah, interactivemesh.org or something like that. You can start out of FX experience. So uh, importers are actually um, uh, very popular, you know, area of um, work. We're going to provide an importer for one format. If we had time, it would be great if we could do more. Um, Does that mean that the, the library has, um, in, in a way, its own um, greatest common denominator animation, you know, format, mm -hmm. just the animation script, not programming animations with transform. Well, okay, uh, so there's... Where that then that would be published, that anyone could take and write something that would just be that. That you don't mm -hmm. need an importer, you just load that file. Well, you've asked a lot of very good questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's several different questions in there, so let me try to break it down. Um, okay, so going back to the import question, what is the lowest common denominator format? Well, that's a difficult question to answer, but a format like OBJ has been around for decades, and it at least imports your mesh, and your materials, your textures, but it doesn't bring in animation, I don't believe, unless someone has extended it. Uh-huh. Building environment. Uh-huh. Talking about within your library. Uh-huh. Is there people who write an importer? Uh-huh. And they're importing Maya, and they're converting it to you, you know, they're converting it to something that has been the standard that you're coding. Like yes. Internal format. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, so we haven't done uh, much work with it yet, but FXML should be able to load in anything uh, into JavaFX and bring in anything that JavaFX understands. FXML is the XML JavaFX file format. So it converts it to FXML, and that FXML actually has that much detail or animation that you can put in. In theory, we haven't 
<laughs> I have to, to be caveat it. In theory, yes. We actually just slurp it in directly for the moment. But uh, in theory, all the stuff that I've shown should be able to be slurped into FXML. Now, um, yeah, we haven't. <laughs> so much with it yet. That I, that, that, that I don't wouldn't have access to at this point if I downloaded, you know, or, or when you know Java 8 comes out and I get 3D. Oh, you can already download it if you have Windows. Well, that's, that's true. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, so download uh -huh. that. Uh huh. But the way that this 3D animation is getting lurked in, as you say. Uh -huh. It's we have several internal things that we have okay. that we will release one of, um, you know, when the time is right, when it's ready to be released. Um, but FXML in theory, and I would like, yeah, we'll we'll play around with it, but um, in theory we should be able to bring in all the data structures that you can create uh, in code in JavaFX, and you know. Um, the meshes, the materials, uh, all that stuff. Uh, it should be able to bring that in. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, that's what, that's what the current understanding is um, in the community. But the idea was to design it so that it could bring in the 3D as well. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Oh, by the way, yeah. So if you guys want to get involved, you know, with 3D and contribute to the community, boy, it'd be so nice to see you guys writing more importers and stuff like that. Like stuff like that. For example, if anybody wants to write uh, an FBX or a Colada importer and uh, make that available, that'd be really, really cool. Or um, yeah. Uh, and there's already some work being done that's under some very generous licenses. Like if you go to, um, it's in C++, what is it called? What is it called, Joe? Uh, asset? Yeah, asset import. Yeah, Google Asset Import. There's basically uh, um, some work in C++, so if anyone's interested in, you know, either writing a Java wrapper for that or, you know, um, Turn that into Java. I think it's BSD licensed. Yeah, there is a Java wrapper for it actually, but I don't know how good it is. Yeah, it looks like it hasn't been touched in about three years. Yeah. Well, I so. mean, it might it might not have needed to be touched. So I, I don't. Yeah. Know. So that might be fun to look into. Um, yeah, if we had the time and resources, you know, we'd uh, do more, make more available. But um, this is where you know, if you're excited about this stuff, this is a Great way to, you know, look at stuff like asset import or look at the favorite file format and look at bringing that in. Um, I think that could be a lot of fun, actually. And um, yeah, um, quite frankly, I'm personally very excited about this stuff. So <laughs> I think it's uh, I think that it's the coolest new feature in JavaFX 8.0. I'm biased. Someone else will say something else, but <laughs> yeah, anybody else have any other questions? So you actually get paid to play with this? Because uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. Yes, I, uh, it is my job. It is my job. And um, that, uh, I'll tell you some true stories. So Java 1, 2011. Uh, yes, I was, uh, we were up some very late nights working on trying to get the demos to work for Java 1. Like, uh, <laughs> this doesn't be recorded. I'm going to say, say this one. So we were working at until midnight one night, and then Jasper goes, oh, we have to keep on working. So we went over to Jasper's house and kept on working until like 3 or 4 a.m. And then, and, and then I went back and I got some sleep, and then I went back at 9 a.m. So it is fun, but it is also, uh, it, it takes effort to uh, make stuff turn out, uh, you know, the way Jasper wants it to. <laughs> no, no, he's a genius. <laughs> he's, a, he's a genius. He has, he's a visionary. Visionary is the right word. Because he has a lot of, a lot of great ideas and um, 
Uh, it's fun to make them happen. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, connecting up Connect, that was his idea, uh, to Duke a couple of years ago. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he's got a whole bunch of ideas uh, for this Java one. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, you'll be able to come and see what we're going to cook up. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about uh, 3D also to take note is that there are a lot of 2D features that are available that also enhance 3D. For mm -hmm. example, 2.2 um, we have a canvas feature that allows you to uh, draw to a 2D texture. And what you can use that for um, would any of the images you use to set on a 3D mesh could come from a canvas. Um, mm -hmm. You'd have to be pretty clever to write normal maps to, dynamically, uh, because there's actual, actually some math there, but, you know, it'd be pretty easy to draw uh, some color to a, a texture using canvas and then set that on a 3D mesh. Um, to, to use. So there, there are some other examples to, you know, you can create seamless textures to be used on three dimensions too. Um, and I think Oleg also did video on the three dimensions, which is another. Yes, he did. Here, let me, let me. Uh, uh, but there are a lot of, a lot of two D features that can kind of be in, uh, synergized with some of the three D features, which uh, at this point none of us have just done. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. we can see What, what is the minimum hardware requirement to run this? Excellent so, question. So for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, how about the Android application? Yeah, and uh, we don't support Android. But um, yeah, uh, in general, uh, well, currently, JavaFX 3D, whatever, uh, the early access release, is available for Windows only. Uh, we're actively working on a Mac version. Um, I mean, this is running on uh, an NVIDIA, whatever, 80-something M, you know, not even the, you know, the 8000 series. So it's basically five years old, and it runs on an NVIDIA, uh, five years ago, card, mobile card. Um, basically, any modern, semi or semi-modern NVIDIA, or ATI, or Intel HD, you know, 4000, or uh, I've heard that it runs on HD 3000. Um, so currently you can run it, you know, let's say Windows 7 um, uh, or 8, um, ATI, NVIDIA, it's HD 3000, 4000-ish. Um, yeah, so anything that's, you know, modern or roughly sort of modern uh, hardware. Uh, and then, yeah, we're actively working on the Mac uh, version. So for those of you who uh, use Macs, that should be coming out in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I was reading something in the news blog about JavaFX running on iOS or on Android or some sort of compiling support or? Oh, well, Nicholas, do you want to give an official answer to that? Um, so we've done prototypes of, um, of JavaFX on, uh, on iOS and uh, on Android also. And um, so we're, uh, we're going to be, let me see, open sourcing uh, those prototypes, but at this point, Oracle doesn't have a plan to to basically um, um, release an Oracle product um, that does that. So um, we've done, you know, we've done surveys and we've talked with uh, quite a few uh, people in the developer community. Um, there's a lot of people who are. You know, you know, 
interested in uh, taking the code and, uh, and essentially um, uh, <coughs> building uh, building uh, uh, a runtime for for iOS or for Android. So it'd be a VM running inside the operating system. Um, yeah. So the the way to so Apple has some restrictions, uh, like you cannot uh, uh, you you cannot um, uh, load anything dynamically resources and other case so you, you essentially have to bundle you have to bundle the VM um, with your application. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I have to co sign. And uh, and that way you can uh, you can actually uh, post it on uh, on the app store. Actually we've done that um, we've done that on uh, on the Mac OS uh, app store, if you look for, uh, if you have a, a Mac and um, you do a search on, uh, on JavaFX, you will see an application called Ensemble. Um, it's uh, JavaFX with a uh, with dairy. What is that for? But just do a search for JavaFX. Oh, this is what Joe described earlier. Uh, sequence of images um, as a texture uh, for a surface that is being deformed by raindrops. One data domain modifier code to make it load in to, to, to assign that as your. Um, that your service texturing, is that what you call it? A uh, texture. The texture, okay. Yeah, funny. Texture is two-dimensional. <laughs> anyway, um, you just assigned a different thing as the texture. Uh-huh. And when Joe was talking about using a canvas, you simply, a canvas is a node, and you just simply assign that node as the texture. Um, it might be a little bit more <laughs> than that, because uh, because basically you, you would write to the canvas and then get it, uh, use a writable image and, and get uh, it you have that to, way. So you have a, it's translated to yeah. an image, so texture can only be an image. Texture can't be a writable method. Right. Okay. But, but there, there are, um, there's a blog post example of that somewhere on the internet. Mm. <laughs> okay. You can go for it. Uh, just, just Google for 2.2 uh, canvas. And image pattern, and uh, you'll find an example of something, and there's code examples too. Okay. Yeah. So feel free to blog about everything you've seen except for the Duke chess set. <laughs> 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 and the Jasper being a slave. Oh, well, no, no. He's the Jasper being an innovator. And I mean, that was, you know. What do you expect for Java 1, right? I mean, <laughs> for Java 1. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, and yeah, anyways. Yeah, innovation takes work. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, so let's see. Uh, Jasper, you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. I, um, yeah, glad to see the interest. Oh, I should have said that. Stuff. <laughs> about, yeah. Uh, everybody, uh, there's shirts in the back, and we're required to take a slide of Solaris balls. Hey, thanks so much for organizing this and stuff. Yeah. He's in Europe somewhere. He was supposed to at least be online. Yeah, he's at DevOps. Right. Should be DevOps
So how do you think it went for you? Pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Congratulations, Z. That was pretty. Oh. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> You're right with those, those 3D packages. You know, I was thinking about the ones that have been around for like yeah. a decade or more. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it goes and find out the 3D package that's it's pretty neat. It's built for uh, concept design and 3D. So, yeah. So, does Raspberry Pi? No, Raspberry Pi doesn't have a GPU. It does. Mm -hmm. it, it does. does. It does. It actually has a better GPU, I've heard, than the uh, Beagleboard. Really? Yeah. yeah. So have you tried? No, I mean, no. Oh, yeah. You, 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 you would need... You, you, you mean need 3D? A, oh, 3D? Yeah, you would need a uh, li Linux and OpenGL. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's... So we have a highly... Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure we'll try it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it'll go over well. It might, actually. But, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, that actually, yeah, really good call. Oh, thanks. Glad you had the idea. Thanks for coming. Yeah. And thanks for the shout out for the light wave. You know, you're, you don't hear a lot of, uh, as a light wave user, it's like, everybody's talking. Maya, Blender, 3D Studio. Right. Because if it was that hard, it would definitely influence. Yeah, that's pretty good. Well, that's pretty good. 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 That's